and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. Take over, come breathe in me, and I will rise on eagles' wings. Come live in me all my life. Take over. Good morning, everyone. Now it's going to be easier to have this in my hand. Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this um, pre-winter morning. It's we we can hear or we can see and feel how it's going to be later in in uh, the season. Welcome here, and we are glad that you can be with us. Welcome again to Peter Abetz and his wife Jenny is with us today. We are glad you could join us too. My you enjoy being with us also this morning. Um, yeah, I didn't see any new people here, but welcome to all of the rest that are used to be coming to, to this place and being served with the wonderful Word of God. Before we carry on with the service, I would like to finalize the announcements, and then that is out of the way, and we can carry on. Although the announcements are actually quite important, um, it's, uh, let's see what is the first one. That's about our group uh, studies and our personal Bible studies, God's plan for us. Um, we are sorry that the printed books are not available yet. We have got the studies on the uh, website uh, for you to start so long. And uh, I've seen that there was one or two people that put in uh, the, uh, um, your orders for printed books. Um, so if you, could, if you could perhaps just give us an indication whom of you would like either English or Afrikaans books printed for you, uh, then we can do that in the, the first two weeks, of first two days of the weeks, first two days of this week, and we can bring it to you. Um, the, the, uh, the set is already on the, on the online, uh, the English ones and the Afrikaans ones will come there today. But I want to encourage you to do the study. Um, I've been through it now, and I told Anita, the people that are not going to do that, this, they're going to miss out. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful letter, the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. And these Bible studies will help you with the nine sections that we can do in this time. 
to understand what is happening there. So we want to really encourage you. Do it for your personal Bible study. You won't be able to do it in five minutes. And we need to spend more time than that per day. Um, but you, you will find with, with a little bit of effort, you will really learn much more, not only of God's plan for us, but also of the wonderful book of Ephesians. So I want to encourage you to start with that study. Um, and then we also want to encourage groups to form and to discuss that during the weeks. Um, that is really going to help us as church also to learn more about what God's plan for us is. Then the next one is um, the Mother's Day meet. And this is another one I would like to stress that uh, the, the ladies, please don't miss out on this one. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to be treated and you're going to enjoy just hanging out with one another and also reflecting on your, your role as a mother in your home and encouraging one another for that. So please um, don't miss out with that one. And uh, let, I think it's Anita that must know. That's right, let her know later in the week if you can do that, please. The next one is um, just the next services. So our next visiting pastor for the English service would be Pastor Richard Bailey from the Presbyterian Church. Um, and then the last one is about a prayer, the Global Day of Prayer. Um, we will give you more information next week, but it's in three weeks' time, so I thought just put that on your ca calendar so long. That is the Sunday of the 28th of May. Um, it's in the middle of the day, and it is in Williton, so it's not far from here, so it's easy to do that. Let's see if we can form a group that can go there together for the Global Day of Prayer, and we can start organizing that next week and the week after that. So those are the announcements, um, and then we can carry on with, um, with today and with God's message for us through Pastor Peter, or Reverend Peter. So let's, let's pray together. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love, your provision, your grace, and especially for your presence with us today. Thank you for the personal way how you go about with us as sinners on this, this wretched world. And still you are involved in our lives. And you associate with us as we gather as your children. Thank you for that. So as we stand up and start singing and praising you and glorifying you, will you hear our hearts and will you also revive our hearts so that we just realize how privileged we are and how good you are. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's stand and let's sing uh, three wonderful songs. We're going to start with 10,000 reasons, and then we're going to follow it up with good, good father. So let's stand and sing some beautiful songs. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forever you 
to dedicate ourselves to this good, good Father. Let's sing, I give you my heart. This is my desire to honor please thank you that we that we can sing your praises and of your virtues and that we can now dedicate ourselves to you and even as we give something of ourselves will you bless it and will you bless us as we listen to your word during this service and we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's carry on with our dedication and worship. And let's serve the Lord with our um, offering. Giving something of ourselves as a token of, our, of the seriousness of our request to take our hearts and to live for him. Let's serve the Lord now. Turn it. 
Can one of you come for me, please? Thank you. Let's let's pray together. Thank you, dear Lord, that you provide for us. Thank you that you've given your Son for us, and that you accept our lives even if we are sinners. But we need to repent and to renew. So we come to you again today, and we've now also just with this token, Riem, just we want to show you that that we want to live for you. And now we pray that you will also use this offering to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our children can now... Go for leave for the um, Sunday school classes also. And just before um, we go to the sermon, um, Reverend Peter has given us an outline of the sermon. Thank you very much, Peter, for this. So if you do not have one now. There are still a few on the table. Annette, I will bring this one to you. Oh, you've got one. Okay, that's good. So everyone that needs one, there are still some available. Um, so um, let's just pray before we sing the next song. Um, and the next song will be a song that dedicate ourselves to the Lord when we sing, Change My Heart, O Lord. But before we, we um, listen to the sermon, I would just like to pray for a few people in the church too, please. So pray together. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we we thank you that we may be in your presence now and um, that we can um, adjust ourselves to listen to your word. We thank you for the message that you've given Pastor Peter and that he will bring to us through your spirit. But we thank you that we can also come as a church And pray for one another and for people in need, also outside of the church. And this morning we've heard of the many people in India, in a specific um, region, that are so targeted by the the radical Muslims there that they are killed. And churches are built, um, women are raped, houses are are burnt down. Um, So, dear Lord, with all this destruction and the hatred there, Will you please protect people that, that serve you and that are vulnerable and whose lives are threatened, please, and also whose livelihoods are threatened. Please help them there. But thank you that we can also pray for people in our own church who need your help and assistance. Maybe there are families who are struggling financially. Will you please help them and give them assistance? Maybe there are people that, that have troubles, um, with either work situations or relationships in their homes or maybe in families abroad, will you please help them and assist them? And then there are people in our church who are ill and who are recovering, and we pray for them. Thank you for days you can be with us today, and we pray that you will help her in this slow process of recovering, but that you would um, keep her close to you and that you will heal her body totally. Pray for you, Anita, who is back in the hospital um, with treatment, and we pray that you will really um, help her so that the treatment can commence and that she will really get better again. Uh, we thank you that we can glorify you for people whose, whose um, sicknesses has changed. We also pray for Annette, um, who has to leave us and that you will guide her in on her way. 
And dear Lord, we also pray for Reverend Peter with the very difficult task he has um, as, as your representative in a very hostile world. Will you give him the guidance, um, the strength, and also yeah, the time, as he says, to do everything that is necessary. And as he bring the word, will you also bless him today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing that last song before we listen to the word. Let's prepare ourselves for what God is going to say to us. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh Uh, oop, oop, <laughs> coming through now, <laughs> loud and clear, good, won't be too loud. <laughs> okay, 
Well, it's a pleasure to be with you again this morning. And uh, if you have your Bibles there, I'd invite you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we'll read the first 11 verses, 2 Peter 1. <clears throat> and I'm particularly focusing on verse 3 through to the uh, end, through to 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I wonder whether you've ever seen it, where you've been driving through the countryside and there you see a concrete slab out in a paddock. Somebody obviously was, had great intentions of building something, but they never got past the stage of laying down that concrete slab. You wonder what was the intention, what was the purpose of the exercise that they uh, undertook? What was the dream that they had uh, originally? You wonder why didn't they continue with that building project? Foundations by their very nature are designed to be built on. And I guess that most of us here at some point in our lives would have confessed faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a very beautiful thing. Um, the Apostle Peter, in writing this second letter, was concerned that many people had professed faith in Christ, but that's where it stopped. They didn't actually build on that foundation of faith. And he was particularly concerned about this because he knew that those who fail to build on the foundation of faith are particularly prone to being drawn into false teaching or by false teachers and or also drawn in by the prevailing culture. And when Peter wrote this, probably about 60 AD, false teachers were plentiful. And obviously, just in any culture, there's always the pressure for Christians to kind of go with the flow of the culture rather than actually standing on the green good so faith alone is the foundation of the of the believer's life um, you know, Peter says in this letter to those who through the righteousness of God of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours it's precious 
because it makes us right with God. And he makes it quite clear that our faith is a gracious gift of God. It's made possible, not because we're good people, not because of anything we've done, but by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our faith is a gift of God's grace. And it's noteworthy that the word that Peter uses for have received a faith is the word that means received by casting a lot. In other words, Peter drives home the point or recognizes the fact that this is God's initiative. The fact that you and I have faith is not because we're such clever people or anything else that comes from us, but it's, a God, it's undeserved. God has given us this gift of faith. And this faith, from a human perspective, is us taking hold of God's willingness to be in relationship with us on account of Christ's saving work. So faith is absolutely essential. Without faith, we have absolutely nothing. And Peter drives home just how wonderful this faith is by pointing out in verse 3 that through faith, we have received everything we need for life and godliness. Because Jesus is divine and now seated at the right hand of God the Father, he has the power to give us everything that we need for eternal life and for living a godly life. That is, a life that's lived in a manner that's pleasing to God. And this capacity to live a godly life comes to us through knowing Jesus Christ. And this knowing or knowledge, as he calls it, is not something that is just learned academically, but it's actually through the fellowship with Jesus Christ. Knowledge is so important. We need to know the facts of the gospel. We need to know the facts, but the facts in and of themselves don't actually constitute faith. But it's through his glory and goodness that he's given us these great, these precious promises. And taking hold of these promises, that's what faith is about. And this promise of eternal life, the promise of sins forgiven, the promise that we're already now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, they're absolutely wonderful promises. And it's through these great promises that uh, he says that we participate in the divine nature in the sense that we have the Holy Spirit actually living within us. And we are actually part of his body. And so we share in his glory and his goodness. And that word goodness is not the way the world measures it, but it, it's actually about moral excellence as far as God is concerned. Now, we live in a society that's increasingly embracing uh, things that are evil and calling them good. And when we live in that kind of environment where there's such confusion about what is actually good, it's quite easy for us just to go with the flow of our, our culture. And little by little, we can actually drift along and we're no longer standing actually on the truths of God's word. But Peter reminds us here that the one who called us, that is, who opened the way for us to leave the kingdom of darkness and called us by name into his kingdom of light, he's also provided us with everything that we need to escape the corruption of this world. Or to put it more positively, the one who called us out of darkness has also given us everything we need to live a God-pleasing life. And Peter says, for this very reason, what does he mean, this very reason? This very reason you've received so much from Christ. He says, make every effort to add to your faith, or if you like, build on that foundation of your faith. See, faith, in a sense, is like the starting line Without faith, you've got nothing. Without faith, you cannot build a godly life. Without faith, you cannot draw near to God. Without faith in Jesus Christ, we have absolutely nothing. But all too often, Christians, as people who have faith, they are kind of content with just knowing that, hey, we've been redeemed by Christ you know, we were sinners lost in sin, destined for hell. Now I'm a believer and I'm destined to spend eternity with God when I breathe my last. Hey, that's fantastic and praise God for that. that. That in a sense is the heart of the gospel, but there's more to it. 
just simply believing those things, as wonderful as they are, is actually to fail to build on the foundation that God has so graciously laid down in our life. Peter implies that it really is impossible for the believer just to sit back and relax and kind of think, hey, there's nothing more for me to do. I'm saved. That's all there is to it. Because the grace of Jesus is the very basis on which Peter commands his readers to make every effort to add to your faith. See, unless we make every effort to add to our faith, we kind of become flabby Christians. And sadly, that's what happens all too often. It happened in the days of Peter. So you know, it happens in our day too, that people are flabby Christians. And surely that's not where we want to be. We don't want to allow stagnation to set in. That's why Peter says to his readers, add to your faith. And it's interesting, the Greek word that's translated ad in, in our Bibles is actually a word that comes from a metaphor that comes from the Athenian uh, uh, drama festivals. In uh, the ancient Athens, rich individuals known as choreographers they joined with the poet and the state in putting on plays and they funded a big part of the cost. And so rich individuals used to compete with each other to be the most generous in funding these plays to be put on and you know, to, to make them as, uh, as grand and as, as uh, flamboyant as, as they possibly could. They would pay for the uh, equipment, for the training of the, the actors and so on. And so this word, translated ad, comes to mean generous and costly cooperation. So to add to our faith, it's about engaging with God in this generous and costly cooperation. In other words, we're to make every effort by means of generous and costly cooperation with the Spirit to build on that foundation of our faith. And this calls for more than just turning up at church every now and again or even every Sunday. In fact, to build on the foundation of your God-given faith may actually require changes in our lifestyle. Perhaps to take time to perhaps not watch a TV program, but to spend time in your, in, in your Bible or preparing for your Bible study uh, group or your home group or even taking time, as Pastor Gerhard said, about your home groups, you know, that Bible study groups. It's so important that we engage in those things so that we build on that foundation of our faith. Or perhaps you might want to do uh, one of the evening courses that are run by Trinity Theological College uh, here in Perth. And I've got to declare I'm one of the trustees, so I've probably got a conflict of interest here, but uh, it's definitely a, uh, these evening courses, uh, short courses on different Bible books, great opportunity where we can build on that foundation of our faith to grow in Christ-likeness. See, spiritual growth only takes place when we as believers expose ourselves to the work, to the word of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. See, to add to our faith, to build on that foundation of our faith, it's costly in terms of time and of energy. But it's the kind of costly cooperation that we as Christians are called to that's what God wants from us, that our lives might become lives of such quality that we will not be led astray by false teachings, that we won't pander to the devil's desires that linger in us. And so Peter spells out that we are commanded to add certain virtues to our faith. And the list that he gives there is not an exhaustive list, but it's more a sample of the kinds of virtues that need to be added. And that list is not something that's just for super Christians. No, it's for all of us. It's to be the objective of all of us as God's people to be actively engaged in building those qualities, those virtues into our lives 
because as we build them into our lives, we actually reflect Christ more fully. And as we look at those virtues, you'll notice that they have a lot in common with the fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians 5. You know, as a believer, we can never say, oh, now I've finished adding those virtues to my life. Now I've, I've achieved that. It's not like that. It's a matter of continual growth. You know, the day that we stop growing spiritually is really the day that we begin to die spiritually. So let's look briefly at each of these virtues that Peter mentions and that he says we are to add by costly and generous cooperation with the Holy Spirit. The first one is goodness. It's the same word that Peter uses to describe uh, the work of Christ in verse 3. Uh, goodness is moral excellence in the practical sense. It's about a quality of life. In other words, we're to add to our faith a quality of life that reflects the moral excellence and the attractiveness of Jesus Christ. See, true human goodness is actually Christ-likeness. How can we acquire that? It can only be acquired through an ongoing personal study of the scriptures, an ongoing personal encounter with a living Christ. Practical goodness is indispensable in, to genuine Christian discipleship. And that's why James says, you know, faith without works is dead. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works. And it's not that he doesn't think that faith with saved by, gra by grace uh, through faith alone. It's not a contradiction. But what he's saying is faith actually brings consequences. Faith changes our lives. Faith is the foundation on which the, we, build these, uh, we build the Christian life. And part of that is to grow in these virtues. Then the second one is knowledge. Now, knowledge is so important. We live in a day and age where people are more focused on feelings rather than facts or knowledge. But for us as Christians, the facts of the gospel, the facts of what God has done in history are absolutely critical. And we need to know those facts. There's no substitute for knowing and being familiar with, the, uh, with what the Bible uh, teaches and the historic events that God allowed to take place to bring about the coming of the Saviour and so on. But a great knowledge coupled to faith, that leads to a deepening of faith and a growth in obedience. And if you have this greater knowledge, it also makes you much more discerning because you're able to pick up false teaching. So I'd encourage you to you know, pick up Christian books don't just limit your Christian life to coming to church on Sundays, but engage in building your faith through building up your knowledge of the things of God. The third one he mentions is self-control. That's basically about controlling our passions instead of being controlled by our passions. It's basically about the problem of human wickedness because for the Christian, self-control is actually about submitting to the indwelling Christ. The indwelling Christ, by his spirit, he makes self-control possible for us. By our yielding to him, yielding to Christ, it's not just a once-off once event when you declare faith in Christ, but in a sense, every morning when you wake up, you have a choice to make. Will I live my life in obedience to Christ today or won't I? Will I go and do my own thing? We need to learn to yield every day and more and more of our lives to his control. Then he mentions perseverance. It's from practicing self-control that perseverance actually develops. And perseverance is really the ability to stay on course, to keep your cool in the midst of difficulty and distress. And it enables you to withstand the opposition of the world and the enticements of the old nature that rear their head from time to time. Then he mentions godliness. That's the genuine awareness that every area of life 
needs to be lived in submission to God's will. And then he mentions brotherly kindness. That's a, a practical, warm-hearted affection for our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And that leads us up to love. And the word that he uses there is the word agape, the, the uh, famous chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is about agape love. And agape love is the love, it's a self-giving love. It's the love that God gives to us in Christ and having received that love, it empowers us to actually give out that self-giving love to others. So it's a love that flows from within us because we first received it from God through Christ. It flows because God in Christ forgave us and he made us new people. And so Peter, having commanded his readers to engage in this costly cooperation with the Holy Spirit to continually strengthen these virtues in their life, Peter now speaks to them of the result of adding these virtues uh, to their faith. The result is that he says, we will not be ineffective or unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Or positively stated, if we make every effort to add these virtues to our faith, if we make every effort to build on the foundation of our faith and have these virtues in increasing measure, nurturing them so they're continually growing in us like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, then the result will be that you'll be amazingly effective for the kingdom of Christ. So that raises the question, how do we actually measure? How do we measure our effectiveness for Christ? How do we know whether we're productive? And perhaps as Christians, we're, we're kind of a bit hesitant to talk about our productivity for the Lord because, hey, that sounds like we might be trying to brag, but... But God calls us to be productive citizens of his kingdom. And so we do need to ask ourselves that hard question, how productive am I really for the kingdom of God? How productive am I in terms of making Christ known? How productive am I in making my life increasingly reflect the very character of Jesus Christ? See, Peter makes the bold assertion that anyone who does not have these qualities of goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love in increasing measure, he says, if you don't have those in increasing measure, he says, you are nearsighted and blind, and you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins. Brothers, how can we ever, how can we ever forget that we've been forgiven of our past sins. Surely that's unthinkable. It's almost like you know, that concrete slab, that's our faith, is taking a bulldozer to it and ripping up the concrete slab. Because if you've forgotten that you've been forgiven your sin, then there is no slab left. There's no faith left. There's no foundation left. And where would that leave you? It's being indifferent to the very one who died for your sin, indifferent to the one who suffered hellish agony on the cross to buy your forgiveness. It's being indifferent about the fact that we actually got new life and God forbid that it would ever come to that. And instead, Peter gives them a word of encouragement. He says, if you have these qualities in increasing measure, let it serve as a reassurance to you that you have indeed been called and belong to God's redeemed people. Let it be an assurance of your salvation. See, if our faith is characterized by these qualities growing in our lives, then we can be sure that our faith is genuine and that we will indeed persevere even under tough conditions and will eventually receive that rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me wrap it up. You know, faith is a wonderful foundation that God has given us. There's no substitute for that foundation. It's absolutely essential. Without that, you're lost. You're lost in sin. 
and you're living in darkness. It's such a wonderful gift of God's grace. But that gift comes with a responsibility to build on it. And so if you see the evidence of these virtues that Peter mentions, growing perhaps slowly but nonetheless growing in your life, then be assured that's evidence of the fact that you are a child of God. May that be a comfort to you and a refreshing motivation to keep working at building those uh, virtues into your life. But if you're honest and you look at yourself and think, hmm, I really, they're not really evident, then we really need to take heed and we need to turn back to Christ in faith and repent and say, Lord, I've been lazy. I've, been a, I've become a flabby Christian. And recommit to building those virtues into your life so that you too can become a productive member, a productive worker in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ until that great and that glorious day when he returns to make all things new. Let me lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have given us all we need for life and godliness. Father, we, we marvel at your grace that while we were lost sinners, Christ died for us. And we marvel that out of all the people in the world, that by your grace, you have applied your word by your spirit to our hearts and you've given us faith. We thank you for that, that amazing gift of faith and we pray that we would be faithful to the calling you've given us to build on that foundation that we would seek to build in a way that makes us increasingly effective citizens of your kingdom, increasingly effective in reflecting the living Christ into this world. And so, Father, we pray, encourage those that perhaps are discouraged. Pray, Father, that if there have been times of yeah, spiritual laziness, that you would motivate us afresh to build into our lives, that we would see the fruit of the Spirit growing in us and that we would increasingly reflect Jesus Christ into this sin-darkened world. Father, a world that so desperately needs to know Jesus Christ, may we be his light in this world to your glory. Amen. In response to the message, we're going to sing our next song. Well, let's stand as we sing to do that.
let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. Will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way and Bring me back to you to see how long this lead is. There's only one last thing and that is I forgot that I won't have the headphone on Annette but I would like us as church to pray with Annette. Annette has to move down you know, up north uh, in this coming week and it's not going to be easy for her to to be with us so often. Annette, so I can't get to you with, with a cordless mic. Yeah, okay, we could do that. Thank you. I thought we'd just pray with you, Annette. You can, you can sit if you want to. Um, our elder is here. Would you perhaps come with us? So we've got the elder with us and also uh, Shamain as the leader of the pearls. Um, we know that you will still often come to join the pearls. Yes. And we will, we will see how we can help you. And we know your, your body is going to be north, but your heart is going to be here. And we pray that God will give you a place where the two can merge again. So let's, let's pray together. Do you mind if you pray in Afrikaans? No, 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 please. Okay. <laughs> um, dear Lord, if we, if we dedicate Annette to you, we thank you that she um, is such a devoted child of you, someone that's always ready to serve, and someone that's always praying um, and can can witness of how you've answered prayers. Um, and that is a big, a big struggle, dear Lord. She, she prayed for a place and you've given it there. So we pray that you will be with her, that you will guide her, and that you will lead her, and that you will help her to settle. Once a father, ons vrouw, dat u vir een net sal help om te weet, sy is in hand, en u is bezig met die plan, maar that it must be more difficult for us to contact you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Yes, dear Lord, thank you that you are there to help and to assist. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you.
going to have some tea now, and um, we want to invite you for that. And I would like to send you home with the priestly blessing from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we'll see you later again in the term, and we pray for this term that you will have much blessings in your work.